the ultimate power move is turning down $440 million over 15 years and then hit a bunch of dingers and win another million dollars. What a day for Juan Soto yesterday in the Home Run Derby. But we got a fun interview coming up on today's Locked On Brewers All-Star Edition. You are Locked On Brewers, your daily Milwaukee Brewers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Good morning. It's Tuesday, July 19th, and it is All-Star Tuesday. All-Star game is tonight, 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 Central Time from Dodger Stadium. Of course, looking forward to see Devin Williams hopefully pitch in the game. We know Corbin Burns and Josh Hader will not be pitching in the game, but Williams is there and available for the Brew Crew. I'm Dominic Catronio. Obviously, no games to recap right now. Brewers aren't back in action until Friday. And with the MLB draft happening right now, too, we're going to keep make sure once that comes completely to a close, when we actually start recapping all of that, that'll come later in the week. Uh, at, currently, I have that planned for Thursday. And then we have a mystery guest coming for you. Uh, I currently have it slated for Friday, but uh, I don't want to tease it, but it's going to be an episode you're really, really excited about. So that's coming up this week. But you click the title to hear about the guy that is going to join us here shortly. Lane Grindle, one of the voices on Milwaukee Brewers Radio with WTMJ, the flagship home of the Milwaukee Brewers Radio Network. And Lane's a great dude. I've actually known Lane since 2017. Uh, We crossed paths in the college world uh, right after he had got the Brewers job. Uh, He would fill in on occasion for some college basketball games that I was working uh, at our previous employers. So it was really cool to see him grow. And now, you know, he talks about it here in the interview and a little bit about how much he loves Milwaukee and all the places he's lived in the Midwest. Uh, That's, uh, I think, a really fascinating part about he is a Midwest guy through and through coming from Nebraska. But even previous to that, and I'll let him explain further on that sort of stuff. We'll talk about his career, but also we're going to talk about the Brewers. Don't worry. I mean, we recorded this on Saturday, and if you recall, uh, Saturday, or excuse me, we recorded this on Friday of that Giants series, and if you recall, Friday night was the night that Josh Hader uh, had everything implode on him, and before the ball came, before anything like that, so some of it's not completely current, obviously the Brewers lost three out of four in San Francisco, uh, so the records aren't quite exactly current, but still the overall topics are certainly relevant as we get into the chat with Lane Grindle coming up here in just a sec. Before we jump in, i got to tell you about the great anniversary sale happening right now with our friends at BlueNile.com. If you're looking for fine jewelry but having trouble choosing, Blue Nile has jewelry experts on hand 24-7, available via phone or chat to help you find a memorable gift for at any budget. They're ready to help you pop the question or just celebrate a milestone moment of uh, fine jewelry that is as unique as her with the modern convenience of online shopping at BlueNile.com. So the sale, the anniversary sale, 40% off on classic fine jewelry pieces and 25% on engagement ring settings. Plus, every order is insured. It ships for free. It's going to arrive in discreet packaging so nobody knows what's inside. And you can shop stress-free and find your forever piece at BlueNile.com. Dot com today. It's everything you could imagine when it comes to fine jewelry. An engagement ring, some great diamond stud earrings, a great necklace, a tennis bracelet. They have everything available at BlueNile.com. And if it's not perfect, no problem. They've got a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Again, they got the anniversary sale happening right now at BlueNile.com. More draft stuff to come later this week. Also, our mystery guest before we get ready for the All-Star break. But there will be no episode tomorrow. Uh, Let's uh, just sit back, relax, and enjoy the All-Star game here tonight. But without further ado, Lane Grindle. You've kind of been everywhere in the Midwest between South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa native, now Milwaukee. Is there a favorite? And you can say if it's not Milwaukee. What do you remember best about each place? That's a great question. I So it's funny because each stop that I've had, I've been like, I feel like I'm a, you know, I grew up in Iowa, and then I went to school in South Dakota, and then I worked there. And I remember telling people, I'm a South Dakotan. Like, I, I've <laughs> totally embraced it. I'm a South Dakotan. And then you go to Nebraska, and I kind of grew up just across the river from Nebraska anyway. So that was an easy adaptation for me and I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life there I really did but the, the thing I always wondered about was Major League Baseball and when the opportunity came to, to be in a, in a Midwest market and in a, in a market the size that I wanted to be in in Milwaukee 
um, you had to jump at it. And so you make that transition, and now I can't imagine being anywhere other than Milwaukee. I think that's naturally how it goes for a lot of people. I think you embrace where you're at, be where your feet are, right? But we love Milwaukee. It's a, it's a great community. Our family loves it. I've got four kids, and so um, they range in age, and they're all pretty heavily invested in, in, in the community and, and in their schools and with the brewers and everything else. So um, favorite thing about each place? Man, that's that's tough. Um, I think South Dakota, because that's where I got my start in mm -hmm. broadcasting, really. Um, Nebraska, because of the passion of the fans and growing up, loving that, that program and the people that I met. Just being there for 10 years, you meet a lot of people that come through there. And then, of course, here in Milwaukee, um, it's just been getting established, calling baseball games on a daily basis, Major League Baseball, and uh, obviously getting a chance to work around Bob Euchre. I mean, that's, that, that's reason enough, I think, for anybody that has ever come through this broadcast booth. It's, it's a dream come true for anybody that aspires to do this, to be able to, to call him a partner and work with him. is You, you still pinch yourself. I'm in year seven, and I, I still have nights, and, and it's frequent, where I'm driving home shaking my head going, I can't believe that happened today. I can't believe I heard him tell that story, or whatever it might have been. Um, you get to ride his coattails a lot. It's a cool thing because there's a pinch you moment where when you are applying for the job and you are going through the process and your mind starts to wonder like, oh man, like this means I'm going to be working with Bob Euchre. And obviously he's a national brand and a national icon, even in Nebraska. What were the conversations like with your friends when you were first applying for the job and getting it? Were they on that same track of like, oh my God, Bob Euchre, what does that mean for you? What, what were those conversations like? I think anybody that would make the jump, and probably especially make the jump from a college program to a Major League Baseball program as a broadcaster, the, the conversation's going to be around, you're going to the big leagues, you're going to do Major League Baseball. But that was very secondary in the reaction I got, because with everybody it was like, you're going to work with Bob Euchre. Like It just <laughs> totally took precedent over the fact that I was making this big leap in my career, and, and that was fine. I was, I was good with that. And then, you know, for the first 12 months, it was like, oh, tell me a Euchre story. You know, tell me something that Bob did, whatever it might have been. And, and, and so you kind of get through that part of it, the initial part of it, where everybody just wants to feel like they get to live through you in that booth a little bit because he is such an icon and he is one of the greatest entertainers that we've ever seen. And, and certainly, I think, the greatest entertainer that broadcasting has ever seen and, and a really good play-by-play -play guy on top of it. I mean, he's a Hall of Famer for a reason. So... Um, it, it, it was different. That was what everybody wanted to talk about when I got the job, and including myself, not necessarily talk about it, but you're thinking about that a lot because it's just you're not walking into the typical Major League Baseball broadcasting booth. You're walking into Bob Euchre's booth, and you're going to be a part of that. And so um, you're wondering what it's going to be like. You're wondering what, what it's going to be like on a daily basis, right? Like I had met Bob. I had had breakfast with him before I got hired, but... Uh, what's this going to be like day in and day out? And I can honestly say, and, I, and I'm not saying this because I'm doing a podcast with you, Dom, or I've said this before, and it's 100% it's genuine. Um, everything that I thought it might be didn't even come close to living up to what it is. And I think Jeff Levering would say the same thing. Yeah. Um, he's incredibly loyal to his guys that work with him. He treats us like family. <laughs> And um, he's been very helpful to me. I mean, I came in as a guy that hadn't called professional baseball before, and I wasn't sure what kind of mentorship I was going to get from Bob, but he's been a very good mentor to me. I can call him and ask him about things and, and ask him for feedback. He'll give it to me if I ask for it. So um, he's been really good in that way too. And, and so some of those things kind of blew me away. I wasn't sure what to expect. And it's been more than I ever thought it could have been. And when you mentioned the the path for you, for those who don't know, I mean, you were calling college baseball at Nebraska, which is, a, I think, a bigger market than people realize, given the program that is, you know, Big Red and that this, the spread that it has. And obviously, you're just down the street from Omaha, so there's a little bit of a lure of like, hey, let's make it to Omaha, being the Cornhuskers. But what was that jump like for you, experiencing college baseball to big leagues? I mean... It sounds so simple, but you're going from a ping to a crack of a wood bat. You're going from a, a completely different style of maybe effectively wild pitchers in college to guys who can dot up their stuff. What was that transition like for you? So you're right. I think that's the one thing people don't realize 
with where I came from to where I am in terms of you know listeners and ears and attention being paid it was a 26 station baseball radio network yeah. and it was a program that when I first started doing games was a couple years removed from the college world series and they were averaging six to seven thousand fans at a lot of their games and and so it was it was a high profile baseball job for the college level even though it was you know exiting the big 12 eventually and then into the big 10 the program has taken a little bit of step back just in terms of the attention that it gets being in the big 10 but i think that's going to change and i think that uh, they've got the right guy in place there to, to get them back to where they're they're nationally you know a brand again in college baseball but i i remember in my interview process, I met with Craig Council um, because it was so late when I got the job. And so he was already down in Arizona for spring training. And I remember him asking me, like, is, you know, what are your biggest concerns about making the jump from college to the big leagues? And the speed of the game is definitely different. I think that part was the easier part for me. I thought the biggest challenge in year one or year two was more the style. Um, I watched Major League Baseball all the time growing up. I watched, I was a Royals fan. I watched the Kansas City Royals in 14, 15, right before I got the job. I mean, you watched every game if you were a Royals fan over those two years. But it's different than calling it. And the baseball I had been calling, it doesn't matter if you're the three-hole hitter, the four-hole hitter. If the first two get on and there's nobody out, you're bunting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're bunting. The third baseman, there's... And, and you're, you're not just bunting because you're trying to put down a sacrifice. I mean, that's what you're doing. But there's like a 20, 25% chance that the third baseman misplays it or whoever misplays it and you get on base anyway. Like, that. that's kind of the style that you would see. When you would see a big leaguer, you kind of knew right away. I can still think back to big leaguers that I saw playing college baseball and just how much they stood out and I'm and I, I love the college game I think it's phenomenal but when you see a big leaguer you know I remember seeing Anthony Rendon at Rice in Houston for a tournament and it was like two innings in and I'm like that's a big league third baseman like it was just it was so much different than the other guys on the field Kyle Schwarber called a bunch of his games in college and you knew that bat was going to play at the big league level you didn't know where he was going to play defensively <laughs> but you knew the bat was going to make it to the big leagues some of those guys, it was real. Michael Walker was another guy. You, you could watch yeah. him and go, yeah, he's going to be a big league pitcher. So those guys really stood out when you saw them. But the style, I think, more than anything, was the biggest difference. And it took, it took me probably a good year to just get some of the things out of your mind of what you were used to saying, the muscle memory of, in this situation, this is what you do. And the ping going away... Uh, was okay. I, I was I was glad to get the crack of the bat. It sounds just so much more full. Oh, it yeah. sounds proper. I yes. mean, there's something right time and place right for a ping of a bat. Absolutely. I, I spent two summers on the Cape Cod Baseball League interning there, and to what you're talking about, knowing you're seeing a big leaguer, but in that league, you're like you're seeing a big leaguer on every single team and every single every single night. But I, I'm with you with the talent and the speed of the game, and that the, some guys are. You know, naturally head and shoulders above others, and some guys get the most out of their talent. Whereas here in the big leagues, I mean, you're looking at this Brewers roster right now, there's a lot of college talent on this roster, especially on the pitching side of things, too. Obviously, Brandon Woodruff and Corbin Burns stick out there, too. Eric Lauer going from, coming from the Midwest to be a big league pitcher. There's a lot of talent. I think nowadays you're seeing the college game kind of rise to what is expected in the big leagues with what Vanderbilt's done with their pitching lab, with what other schools are doing. It's kind of like a mini Brewer style of, hey, let's develop this pitching in college and then get you on the fast track in pro ball. I think that's what we've all seen, right? I, I think there's no question about that. And you go back maybe 15, 20 years ago, and the reputation of college pitching coaches and just college coaches amongst the pro ranks wasn't great. You know, they overwork their guys. They throw their guys too often. They're, they're not careful with their arms. And, and there's a, a, a reputation that, you know, if you go to college, are they going to take care of your arm? That was, whether it was right or wrong, and I think it was probably more individual from program to program, but there was this overall stigma that people would put on college programs back then. And I think, one, they heard that, but two, we've made such a huge leap in analytics and in what we're able to do with video and everything else in development of these arms that... Um, teams have been able to use this as a recruiting tool rather than the other way around. And so I don't think you hear as much about that anymore. 
I think they're smarter about it. They're understanding how to maximize guys' potential. And I think that's the biggest thing that the Brewers Pitching Lab has done and everybody else's own version of it is you can take a guy like Jake Cousins or Justin Topa, which are a couple of examples for the Brewers over the last couple of years, that were maybe you know left and, and thinking about maybe not even pitching anymore. And if the right eyes get on them and the right guys that can analyze the data and relay that in the right way, all of a sudden they can not just revive a career, they can get them to the big leagues and make them effective. So I think that's exciting for any young baseball player right now coming up is knowing that um, there's probably a lot of guys in years past that were missed that I don't know they're going to get missed anymore and they're going to get more opportunities because there's ways to measure it today that we didn't have 15, 20, 30 years ago. One more quick jump in here to remind you about Built Bar. If you haven't tried the Coconut Brownie Chunk Puff, they also have it available in the bar too. This is their latest gift to your taste buds from the geniuses at the Built Kitchens. That's Built, B-Y-L-T dot com. If you've had the Chunk Bar, the, the Coconut Brownie Chunk Bar, you're going to love the Puffs. If you've ever had the Puffs, it's like a marshmallow but infused with protein. It's that sweet treat you want that's actually good for you. All Built Bars are made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits. The macros on this are off the charts. You can eat something that tastes good and is good for you. Low calorie, low sugar, high protein, and all delicious. The best part, of course, is they taste amazing and they're guilt-free. Delicious coconut rich sweet brownie creamy marshmallow stop fantasizing get the built b-u-i-l-t dot com to order your coconut brownie chunk built puffs today go to built.com and use the promo code locked one five again promo code is locked 15 to get 15 percent off your order at built.com so let's let's talk about the the brewers a little bit too as we are sitting here recording this Friday before the All-Star break. So if Brandon Woodruff goes and throws a perfect game tonight, cool. It's not going to make it into this show. But overall, the first half, the Brewers have played well. Uh, obviously, 50-40 and 40 here on Friday. Let's, let's just go ahead and say they sweep the weekend and they go 53-40 and 40 here in the first half. Who knows what will happen. Right. But overall, what would you grade the Brewers in this first half of on the regards of what you expect and what it's actually become this season a being absolutely exceeding expectations and C being more about eh, that's probably what I expected so I, I think that I if you would have asked me before the season you know where their record would be at the break I, I, I would have been okay with this yeah. I mean I'd have been good with a, a 50 plus win quote unquote first half of the season um, that being said I think that some perception is that it's not as good as what the record actually is because they got off to that great 30 game start 50 game start right and it looked like maybe this was going to be a repeat of last year where they just ran away and and and, and hid with this division I, I never anticipated that was going to be the case i think the cardinals are a really good team i think they've gone through their own struggles too and the brewers of course have a three game lead as we record this but um, I, I feel like and i felt like since spring training that these two teams were going to exchange punches and blows not literally, but figuratively. Oh, I want to see some blows. No, what are you I mean, talking about? No, entertainment's <laughs> always good. Um, but over this whole second half of the season, I just think that it's going to be these two teams and it's going to remain that way. But I, I, I would. I would give this team an A for what they did in the first half. And the reason why I say that is they've dealt with a lot of injuries on the, yeah. on the pitching staff specifically. Those are hard things to overcome. You anticipated the rotation was going to carry them. It hasn't always been the case over the course of the first half because of those injuries more than anything. Corbin Burns has backed up his Cy Young and then some. Brandon Woodruff's starting to look like Brandon Woodruff again. That's a really good sign. But you haven't had Freddie Peralta since May. Uh, Eric Lauer had the great start um, but hasn't pitched maybe as well over the last month or so of the season. Adrian Hauser is injured. So to overcome that and the road trips that they had to go through, it's easy to dismiss that as well everybody plays on the road and everybody plays 81 on the road and 81 at home but man not every schedule is the same yeah and when you have three three city road trips and you're away from family and you're out of your own bed you know the first one's kind of tough the second one's kind of like okay this is a grind to get through it the third one's like i can't believe we're doing this again <laughs> so for them to get through all of that dom and, and and still be in first place and really have a very favorable schedule in terms of road home 
three different road trips or one city trips. They finished with, I think, 21 of 26 at home in September. I think they positioned themselves really, really well for the second half. Who would you rate as your Brewers' first half MVP? Ooh, man. Um, I think I'd probably go Corbin Burns. Yeah. I mean, Devin Williams is kind of in that conversation. Josh Hader certainly should be in that conversation. Uh, Rowdy's had a good season as well. I think I go Corbin. I think maybe the more interesting thing is who are the guys, and not to steal your thunder and ask ask the questions on this. No, podcast, bring it on. Who are the guys that have been the under the radar MVPs? Mm-hmm. The guys that have contributed in ways you didn't anticipate they would, and are big parts of why this team is where it is. Hobie Milner mm-hmm. is, is incredible. Trevor Gott's yeah. been really good the last couple of times out, um, and just keep going on down that list. Victor Caratini has been. Um, an incredible addition for this team and, and really contributed. So those are the guys that really stand out to me. I think it, so often it's the depth pieces that step forward and maybe perform more than what you anticipated that end up being the difference when you're trying to win a division. And then I, another unsung hero I like is Chase Peterson. Oh, yeah. What he's done defensively at third base, when he's in a conversation with guys like Nolan Arenado, Key Brian Hayes, Matt Chapman as far as defensive metrics, what an incredible year it's been for him as far as not playing every day too he's a guy that's not going to play against lefties he's a guy that is asked to come off the bench and be ready at any given moment and he gets on base while playing near flawless defense at third it's another example of pushing the right buttons and leading into my next question watching craig council manage on a nightly basis I don't know if we all are able to appreciate it as much as we can in the moment because you don't get to analyze managers like you can, like with a batting average or with an OPS or an ERA. But what would you explain to folks about why Craig Council is such a great manager and what you've seen over the last seven seasons? Well, the thing that really impresses me about Craig, beyond the fact that he's always been able to establish a great culture, and now I think the culture is almost self-governed right like there's just this expectation of this is the way we do things here with the brewers and i think he did a great job of establishing that in his time in 2015 but then really starting with spring training at 2016 and that first year as the first full year as the manager of the brewers but the other thing that really i think he does a great job of and you hear players talk about it a lot is that he manages for tonight but also is able to keep an eye on how this is going to impact this team down the road uh, whether it's over the next couple of games of the series or the next week or just the big picture, he always kind of is able to keep both eyes on this game here, the immediate, and what the big picture is. He never loses sight of that. And sometimes people want to see Josh Hader throw five days in a row, but you're not <laughs> going to see that with Craig because he is going to take into consideration guys' health and how can you get them to the finish line of the season at peak performance. I think that's really critical. And I think he does as good a job as any manager does at managing that type of situation. So let's get ready to wrap up this with two more quick questions. First and foremost, as we sit here in San Francisco record this, uh, I always like to joke with you guys about Stonehenge. And for those who don't know about Stonehenge, if you want to help break it down, for those who may have heard about it, don't know exactly what it is, what is Stonehenge? So uh, we call it Stonehenge. I also refer to it as the Euchre Bible sometimes. Mm. It's, uh, It's our scorebook that we score on. It's been around since the early 70s with Merle Harmon. Um, and that's how Bob learned how to basically score games when he was calling games. Ken Summerfield is nodding, by the way, yeah, to help paint the picture. Yeah, I the uh, approval and the confirmation from Kent Summerfield on that. But uh, it is large, it is heavy, um, and there's a specific way that we score. So everybody that works with Bob, you know, we all know how to score a game, but you score with him. And so when we're at home, whether Jeff's working with him or I'm working with Bob, Um, We will score our three innings, and he scores his six innings that he's on the play-by-play for. And we fill out the book, and we have all the stats and all the positions and everything else, just like a normal score sheet would have. And you have to learn Bob's language, essentially. And it was Merle's language before that in terms of how you score a game. So I had a way that I scored the game before I came here. And I learned this language by taking old score books out and having them next to me and scoring games in the back of the booth when Jeff and Bob would be working for that day when I was going to start working with Bob. And uh, it's actually kind of fun. I really like the format 
and uh, enjoy it. The only time I don't enjoy it is when I have a two-mile walk to the ballpark like today here in San Francisco, and I have that in my backpack. <laughs> Who has the best penmanship in there, by the way, between the, th- the, the three of you guys? Oh, man. Um, I, I would probably go... And he's going to deny this. I think Jeff has pretty good pen- penmanship. Look, I, look, Jeff's looking over at us like, no the way. The answer is Bob. The correct answer is Bob, according to Jeff. And as we're looking back at some older pages right yeah, now. Yeah, I'm looking back at this. Has Josh got the hang of it yet, too? Has has, has the growing process? No, we haven't put that on him yet. Okay. <laughs> um, I didn't learn it in my first year. You're, there's so much going on in year one where you're drinking water through a fire hose. The last thing you need to do is learn how to... <laughs> score differently, so we haven't put that on him yet. But maybe, maybe that'll be a year two <laughs> lesson for Josh. But that's great. That, it's a beautiful thing, and it's been tweeted before. I'll take a photo of it and yeah. share it on our Locked On Brewers page. And finally, as a rite of passage for any radio broadcaster working with Bob Euchre, we have to close out this podcast with whatever story you want or one that you tell about working with Bob or your favorite Euchre story from uh, your years here in Milwaukee. I mean, there's so many, and, and it's always, it's honestly sometimes hard for me to come up with one because there are so many to pull from, but uh, the one that I have kind of gone to the last couple of years, because I think it just, it's, it's a simple, pretty quick story, but I think it just encapsulates how quick-witted he is, which is really one of the things that makes him so funny. He's, he's one, he's able to deliver a line without laughing, which is an art that I've never learned. Um... And he's, and he's so quick on his toes with things that aren't scripted, that aren't planned in the middle of a game. And last year during spring training, it had snowed in Milwaukee, and we were talking about the fact that it had snowed, and I said, yeah, I got a picture of a bunch of piles on both sides of my driveway. And he said, you used to have to get a prescription for piles. I had no idea what he meant. And, and that's an old term for hemorrhoids. <laughs> and I, and I, it went over my head, admittedly, and I kind of stared at him, and then he explained you know, what it meant, because he knew that it went over my head. And I said, you, you're kind of like an astronaut. You get to go places the rest of us can't, because I wouldn't talk about hemorrhoids on the radio, but Bob Euchre can. <laughs> and without, I mean, I hadn't put a period at the end of that sentence, and he came right back at me and said, I'm just glad you put a Trinot at the end of that. <laughs> and I was like, man, that was totally unplanned. He had no idea I was going to say that. And he had that retort that fast. Like, that's just an illustration of how quick-witted he is and what makes him the only one that is Bob Euchre and the only one there ever will be. That's, that's, that's fantastic. fantastic. And, yeah, yeah, I guess we, we all should, should strive, strive to be astronauts and make sure we finish <laughs> that word and everything we do if we're trying to go out to space. And yeah, everything. Yeah. that is a good, maybe a good little reminder on a daily basis. That ball is headed to the moon and you're an astronaut out there. Make sure you finish it. Thanks, Bob, for the reminder there. Lane, thank you for spending some time here on Locked On Brewers. I know uh, it's taken me way too long to have you on the oh, podcast. No, not at all. Uh, but it, it's been a pleasure. And, heck, we've worked together for a few years, even before I joined the, the Brewers beat. So it's kind of funny to see it come full circle as we sit here in San Francisco. Yeah, that's really funny. Uh, you and I have crossed paths multiple times before you came to Milwaukee. So uh, excited to have you here. You're doing a great job, and I love the work you're doing on the podcast. Appreciate it, Lane. You bet. You are Locked On Brewers, your daily Milwaukee Brewers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.